Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to the LPI, and thank you to all of you for joining us for this session this afternoon. Um, so, as Michelle said, I've been working in the L&D space, um, and particularly in sales and service and marketing training for um, actually slightly more than 20 years now. And I've seen a lot of different L&D projects try to gain traction, both with senior managers in the organization and, of course, with people um, who are the target audience. And some of the things that L&D needs to achieve in that whole process include, for example, uh, securing budget and sign off for new projects, um, establishing L&D as a business partner uh, at the C-suite, perhaps, elevating L&D from a tactical issue to a strategic one, persuading executives to engage in the L&D initiatives that you're putting in place. So not just to sign off on them, but actually to be present and active and uh, to act as coaches and supporters of the initiative. And of course, as I said, to persuade staff to take responsibility for their own development um, so that it's not something that's done to them. Hopefully all of those will feel familiar to you. But I guess one of the things that occurred to me over the years is that many of the things that we do in L&D are actually about selling. You know, all of those things on the screen there uh, are about selling an idea, uh, a desire for somebody to engage in a project, and so on. So because we do a lot of work <coughs> training global sales forces how to sell in a modern and uh, ethical way, um, I thought it might be interesting to use some of those tools to think about how we, within L&D, get people to engage and support our programs. So one of the ways we think about selling uh, is that it requires a balanced approach between results and relationships. So if I just build the graph here, um, at a very transactional level, if you're a salesperson, and I, I will keep flipping between sales and L&D through the course of this, um, but a salesperson who is kind of relatively low on results and relatively low on relationship is what we call um, an administrator or perhaps an order taker. So they're somebody who the client or the customer says, look, this is what I need, and that person will just basically take down some details and, um, and try to make it happen. On the top left side of this grid is somebody who is kind of perhaps more focused on achieving results, but still relatively poor at building relationships. And in sales, that's what we would call a, a pushy salespeople. I think there are perhaps fewer pushy L&D people in the world. Um, but this is kind of, you know, have I got a plan for you? And trying to get um, senior uh, stakeholders involved in an L&D initiative without necessarily building the relationship or establishing the need first. The third box I'm going to talk about is the one where I think a lot of salespeople and perhaps a few L&D people uh, occupy. And that's what I would call the friendly helper box. This is where um, people are very focused on building relationships, but perhaps not as much on driving results from what they do, both for themselves and for the organization. So. In the friendly helper box, um, this is the kind of whatever you want, we'll do, we'll use our skill and initiative to make those things happen. But essentially, uh, you're the boss, you tell me what you need. Now, the top right hand corner is obviously where we're trying to get to, and that is more of a business partner where there's a balance between the results focus and the relationship focus. And um, LD is seen as a proactive equal in the business partnership. Now, I know a lot of you are called business partners or L&D partners, and um, you know, that's clearly the goal. But I think it's, it's helpful for all of us at times to, to ask ourselves, are we actually sitting in the friendly helper box today, or am I being proactive and challenging um, the organization about what L&D can achieve? It's also not a, not a, not a bad tool to, um, to segment your own team if you have a team and think about where the different people in your team might sit within that matrix. So if that is the, uh, the kind of very high level approach to uh, L&D and selling, uh, the question that Michelle asked you earlier, and I'm going to ask you again now, is what are the biggest barriers that you see to getting buy-in to L&D projects? So if I could ask you just to have a think about that, please, and just type into the chat window some examples of the barriers that you've experienced uh, or that you believe are there for achieving 
success in your L&D activities. So we have one that's cost there, presumably the cost of actually doing the, the activity. Engagement, we had time, we had time off the shop floor earlier, um, the time required to do the development, uh, the audience is time poor, will it add value, um, does an order take a culture, thank you. Uh, Ranjit is saying they don't understand the value they would get. Sandra is saying there's a lack of executive support. Kevin's view that others take a view of L&D training that may be not as, as positive as we would like. Uh, recognize as important but not urgent. The first thing to be pulled. Organizer too busy to organize it from Karen. Uh, and Will is talking about ROI. Zoe is talking about lack of resources. Okay. So some really uh, useful comments there, thank you. And solution focused, I want you to provide me with solutions, yep. So as you think about that, and please do keep typing those, uh, those barriers in, there's one bit of research I just want to talk to you about that, um, that relates to this question. <coughs> so Imparto over the years has done many, many pieces of research with clients looking at what best practice in, in selling and marketing is. But one of the most interesting pieces of work we did was correlating business performance with sales competency. And uh, as you would expect, there was a pretty good correlation between how good people were on a range of competencies within selling and their performance as measured by um, quota percentage of quota achieved, pipeline, and so on. But there were a number of outliers, and in fact, there were quite a few outliers to that correlation. So we actually went in and had a closer look at what was driving the success or lack of success for the people who were either much better or much worse than their skill levels would suggest. And there were two factors that came to the top. The second most important was the skill of their manager, which probably won't be a surprise to, to you guys because a good manager can unlock doors internally to get things done, but of course can also coach and make up to some extent for lack of inherent skill uh, in, the, in the salesperson. But the biggest one was a framework that you may have heard of, and that was somebody's locus of control. And it was quite a surprise to us, but if I, if I just kind of um, put up an image of the locus of control, again, you may be familiar with this, there's a spectrum from external to internal. Um, and somebody with an external locus of control generally believes that the outcomes are outside of their control and, and are driven by fate rather than by their own actions. And on the right-hand side, people who with an internal locus of control tend to believe that outcomes are within their control and are driven not by fate but by their own actions. Now, what we found was that people uh, salespeople with an internal locus of control tended to do better than their skill set would suggest. Uh, and those with a very external locus of control tended to do slightly worse. And if you think about it, that's because people with an internal locus of control um, take responsibility for overcoming the barriers they see, um, whereas the people with a, a very, very external locus of control tend to expend their energy talking about the barriers and blaming people rather than trying to fix them. Now, we're all on this spectrum. Very, very few people are uh, completely at one end or completely at the other. And you probably wouldn't be terribly mentally stable if you were completely in external or internal. Um, but the key thing here is to think about your internal dialogue. So if I ask you to go back to the, the answer to the question about what are the barriers to achieving buy-in to L&D projects, and just think about where on that spectrum of external factors to my own skill and actions uh, your answer sits. Now, again, you know there are things that are outside our control, but if we're talking about you know a barrier is cost, it can be useful to reframe that barrier um, in a way that tells us what we can do about it. So rather than you know management doesn't have time or the ROI isn't high enough. It's like, how can I, you know, achieve uh, and overcome those barriers by being better at, you know, creating ROI, better at measuring it, better at presenting, better at managing stakeholders, and so on. So, 
that, in a sense, is a frame for the whole of this session, which is it's about taking um, an internal view of this and saying there are many things that are outside our control, but there are many things that we can actually do to influence stakeholders and to improve the take up of our L&D activities, both um, at the high level of the organization and among the target population. So with that said, what is it that we can actually do? And I guess the thing about achieving buy-in to any L&D project is that much like any purchase, people go through a decision-making process. And Michelle alluded to this earlier. <clears throat> we in the sales world call this the buying cycle. And while if you're talking about an internal customer, um, they may not be uh, buying in their own mind, that's in effect what's going on here. So decision makers go through um, four main stages, five if you include decision, when they're making a decision. And what we can do as L&D people uh, is to guide, to influence, and to add value to that decision-making process. And this is very much what modern selling is all about. It's not about having a sales methodology uh, or applying you know, your agenda. It's about trying to understand the buyer's agenda and influencing and guiding them and adding value to their thinking process. So at a very high level, people start with the awareness of needs. There is a status quo, which may include um, training initiatives, coaching initiatives that are going on right now. Um, and through that awareness of needs process, people become aware of the fact that they need to do something differently. They need to change an approach, they need to add a new piece of training, whatever it is. After that, they then go into what we call the assessment of alternatives, where they consider all of the different approaches that could be taken to meet that need that was identified. And that might be um, finding an external supplier, that might be using the internal team, face-to-face uh, -face learning, e-learning. Uh, it could perhaps include using that budget for something entirely different. Uh, at the end of the assessment of alternatives phase, people generally have a favored solution and usually a backup as well. And they then go into what we call the alleviation of risk phase. And that's where people start to worry about what might go wrong at a tactical level, um, perhaps at a political level, maybe even at an individual level. And if they're high enough in the organization, also at a strategic level. So is this teeing me up for the future in the right way? Then there's a decision process, which usually includes the tail end of the negotiation. And finally, the achievement of results and the measurement of ROI and the other things that will feed back into that loop and allow you to create new opportunities. So if that's what the decision maker is going through, um, a relevant question is, what is it that we as L&D professionals uh, can be doing in order to identify and, and kind of um, succeed in the projects that we would like to be running and the organization needs? So in the awareness of needs phase, <clears throat> Our role is to identify opportunities, to add value, to build momentum behind those opportunities, to prove the value that can be created. In the assessment of alternatives, it's to identify the decision criteria that people will use to choose between competing alternatives. Um, in effect, to pitch, even if it's an internal client, you're still, in effect, pitching your solution to them and then managing stakeholders and their alignment around uh, the outcome that you believe is the correct one. In the risk phase, it's simply to identify the risks that are there and that your stakeholders are perceiving and help to alleviate them. Uh, in the decision phase, it's to secure the decision, and that often involves unblocking the decision process, particularly if there are competing um, issues and competing priorities. And finally, in the achievement of results phase, it's to demonstrate the value and the ROI that you've created, which, as we know, is um, sometimes easier said than done, to find new opportunities and to deepen your position as a trusted advisor to the C-suite. So that's kind of an overview of what I'll be talking about for the next um, sort of half an hour or so before we go into a, a Q&A session. Uh, if you do have any questions as we go, please enter them into the chat box and I'll try and keep an eye on that. Um, if I miss one, Michelle will let me know that there's uh, a, um, a question pending. And the answer is yes, I believe we will send the slides around. 
uh, Poonam, and um, there will also be a recording of the session. So let's begin with that first stage, the awareness of needs, and the first part of that is about identifying opportunities. Obviously, in a short time, there isn't time to go into each of those skills in as much detail as I would love to, um, but I'm trying to give the kind of high level and the most important parts of this. So let's um, ask a question to you. Let's imagine that you had a, a need for a new leadership, or you believe there was a need for a new leadership skills initiative within your organization, or if you're a vendor, uh, within a, a target organization. And here's three possible strategies that you could adopt. You could, if you're talking to a stakeholder, you could explain the features, advantages, and benefits of the proposal. Uh, you could identify the barriers to achieving some objectives across the business that might be related. Um, or you could run a TNA, a training needs analysis, across the target population. So, Michelle, if you could um, set that poll up for us, and I'm going to ask you, the participants, to choose one of those three options, um, and we'll see what the group as a whole believes is the best strategy in this situation. Okay, so it looks as though um, there's relatively few people going for the first choice, and we're roughly equally split between the second and the third. So uh, with all of these, th there is no absolute right answer, and please don't be offended if I say that um, my preferred choice is not the one that you picked. Um, but the, the, choice, the first choice, explaining the features, advantage, and benefits of the proposal, is um, it's certainly something that was taught a lot in sales uh, a number of years ago, but it's it's generally what I would consider slightly old school as an approach because it's very product focused or solution focused. You know, you're starting with the features of the solution and tying it to advantages and benefits, which is good, but those benefits aren't necessarily anchored in the objectives of the business and what the business is failing to achieve. So. Generally, I think there are probably better choices than the first one. Um, the third one, the training needs analysis, uh, whether that's right or not, sort of depends on how you define TNA. If TNA is simply about understanding what skill gaps there are, then again, that's probably not the best way to test the need for the organization for a, a new leadership skills or whatever initiative you're thinking about. And the reason for that is just because there's a skill gap doesn't necessarily mean that there is a business need, a pressing and urgent business need that that skill gap will address. If your TNA encompasses the business need, then um, then I think that's fair enough and, and that would be a reasonable choice. But the one that I would suggest is the, the ideal choice here is identifying the barriers to achieving specific objectives across the business um, with which the L&D initiative can help. So if you think about a decision maker, um, and as the chief executive of an organization, if somebody comes to me and says, look, I'd, I'd like you to consider doing this activity, um, that's much less compelling to me than somebody saying, look, I know you're trying to uh, increase your growth rate from 20% to 30% this year, and here's what's stopping you from doing that. And if I were to do this kind of initiative, it would help to unblock that. That's a much more compelling argument for me as a decision maker. So starting with the business objectives and specifically the business objectives that people are struggling to achieve um, is, a, is a good approach. Now Jackie is asking are we proposing the opportunity um, and in this case yes I'm, I guess there are two types of, um, of kind of lead if you like in, in selling and in L&D. The first is where somebody comes to you and simply says, look, I, I've got a, an opportunity, I, well, there's something I need you to do for me. Um, and the second is where you're going off and generating demand for something um, by, uh, uh, by kind of understanding what objectives are, are being uh, proving difficult to meet. 
So, um, yes, what I was talking about here was where we are proposing the opportunity, and I agree, Ranjit, it's a good question. Um, the one thing I would say is that if somebody comes to you with a, a, a question, can we uh, put in place the following kind of initiative, I think it behooves us to link it back to the objectives that we're struggling to meet in the business, because doing that makes it much less likely that the project will get derailed later on. So um, if I just move on to one of the tools that we use in uh, the sales world that I think can be useful within L&D as well, uh, it's something called the value chain. And the value chain is a way of understanding what objectives there are in the organization that we might be able to help with. And it starts with a list of the functions in the organization across the top. And I've chosen four here. <coughs> Not necessarily the ones that we would necessarily think of choosing as our target groups within L&D. So sales, operations, finance, and the C-suite. And then we look down the left-hand side uh, at three different types of objective. And um, this is a, a tool that we've developed over the years because if you just think about one type of objective, you often miss a number of opportunities. So we think about the key performance indicators that somebody's trying to hit within a function, the current challenges they're trying to meet, and the wider goals that they would like to achieve in perhaps the longer term. So if I look at the sales team, for example, an area close to my heart, a KPI typically is hit the revenue and margin targets. And obviously, you know, there are different sales training initiatives that could help uh, the sales leader to do that. And it may range from you know, blanket training if the issue is um, the skill levels are generally too low across the organization, to very precision, laser-focused uh, interventions if there's a specific issue with a new competitor or a product launch or something like that. Uh, the current challenges could involve uh, establishing a coaching culture, which is something that many of you will have experience of doing. Um, and of course, one of the key things with coaching is that Coaching itself is a skill that requires coaching, um, so bringing that insight to bear can be helpful. Um, maybe their wider goal is to empower the partner network to drive revenue, and that may be something that um, L&D could help with by saying, look, you may not be able to afford to have face-to-face -face training for the partner network, but some kind of e-learning solution that perhaps brought in product training with it as well could be a, a valid way of reaching and, and achieving that objective. The operations team, for example, may have a challenge that's, especially with the uncertainty that we have around us at the moment, um, about being flexible in the face of changing markets. So there might be L&D initiatives that could support that, um, for example, by helping to create a more agile workforce or bolstering management skills within the team. Finance, um, often not thought about as a, a kind of fertile ground for L&D, but Let's say finance has a KPI to reduce operating costs by 3%. Well, um, one of the drivers of operating costs in a business is recruiting and training and the time required to onboard new people. So if we can reduce the churn rate in the organization by um, putting in place initiatives that might improve engagement and satisfaction and employee NPS, um, that could help to support that goal. Uh, the challenges might include cash collection and working capital, um, particularly if the organization is trying to conserve cash in order to invest elsewhere. Uh, and there could be a role for L&D to support that objective by um, establishing that understanding um, in the sales and, and customer support teams. Perhaps they might have a wider goal of establishing a commercially aware culture that, again, could be something that L&D could help with. And then finally, at the C-suite, you know, KPIs at the C-suite will typically include revenue, profit, or EBITDA, um, net promoter score, customer engagement, and so on. And all of those are things that uh, L&D can help with. And finally, um, let's imagine there was a wider goal that might include a stock market listing. That may be something that we can't help with, but perhaps uh, there might be some regulatory issues around that that L&D could support. So. There are two things I wanted to highlight about this. One is, if you take a systematic view of the needs of the organization, it can really help to identify uh, the opportunities where you can help. And 
doing it in a in a more rigorous way will help you to understand and uncover a much wider range of possible initiatives. But the second thing is, if you sit down with one of your senior stakeholders and take them through this kind of an exercise, let me understand exactly what you're trying to achieve, the KPIs you're trying to hit, the challenges you're struggling with right now, and your wider goals, it really positions you as a business partner. Um, and as a salesperson, it literally moves somebody from the opposite side of the table to physically being sat next to the customer um, with this kind of a sheet in front of them and doing it together. So once you have a shared understanding of what the needs are, you're in a much better position to um, to you know be that kind of trusted advisor. One thing I would add is that the opportunities, the, the objectives at that level are sometimes too high level to know exactly what you would do. So there's a form of questioning that's based on root cause analysis that you might find useful. Um, and that is going through three things. One is the objective that your uh, stakeholder is trying to meet. The second is what are the barriers that are stopping them from achieving that objective. And thirdly, what causes those barriers? So if I take a, um, if I use a simple example here, uh, one of the objectives might be be flexible in the face of changing markets. We had that in the um, the operations team in the last slide. So the barriers um, that might stop somebody from achieving that objective could include, for example, lack of operational agility or lack of employee mobility. And you would uncover those barriers by asking questions of the stakeholders that you're working with. And the causes of those barriers might in turn be um, the lack of operational agility might be a lack of core traits in the managers or managers haven't been developed for a long time. And mobility might be perhaps there's a limited ability to retrain people to new roles. So uh, the solutions that you can bring as L&D might include using competencies in recruiting and assessment, some kind of a leadership academy, or some kind of global con competency and mobility scheme. So bringing those in, um, you've got the kind of analysis down to a granular enough place that you can suggest concrete initiatives to help. One of the big things in sales at the moment, a big uh, buzzword, is insight. And um, as L&D, I think we can often bring insight that's quite surprising to senior managers. And I've just noticed on the chat that people have been asking what C-suite means. My apologies. That is a term, you're correct, that means the, the C-suite of the organization, the, the, the chief executive officer, the chief financial officer, um, the chief marketing officer, and so on. So it's any title that has a C at the beginning of it, CEO, CFO, and so on. Apologies for using uh, terminology there. So the kind of insights that we can bring might be the solutions that we can help with, but we can also bring insight by helping people to understand the causes of the barriers, the barriers themselves, and sometimes even the objectives that they're trying to meet. So by being a good asker of questions, um, L&D can really help senior managers to understand not only what L&D can do, but help them to uncover, as a good salesperson does, what the manager themselves are trying to do. So that's the um, awareness of needs phase. And sometimes you won't need to do that if, if stakeholders are good at coming to you with questions. But as I said, often it's good to link back to that kind of analysis to understand what's really driving it. <coughs> the second phase in the awareness of needs is where you're trying to build momentum behind an idea that perhaps one stakeholder has suggested or you've uncovered a need for, but you need to get the rest of the organization behind that. So let's take a look at another question here. Um, if you had, let's imagine, you'd identified and confirmed the need for that leadership academy that we talked about earlier, um, and you're now trying to build momentum behind that initiative in discussion with a number of stakeholders. So here again are three choices for you. Quantify the consequences if action is not taken. Quantify the gain or return on investment, ROI, if action is taken. Or find stakeholders who really care about this issue and bring them into the conversation. So Michelle, if you could bring that poll into the screen for us again. And once again, I'm going to ask you to choose your, uh, your answer here, if I, if I could, please. Okay. 
So Jackie says all of the above. <laughs> Could be a trick question, Jackie, you're right. Yep. So I, I, I accept your points that this is difficult and you might well do all of these. Um, I'm asking the questions really to kind of highlight some of the uh, the key theoretical issues here, but I agree you might want to try and do all of that, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So Jackie says A and C, and um, Jackie, I think I would agree with you, actually. Uh, a is kind of counterintuitive, but let, let's work through these in turn. So A says quantify the consequences if action is not taken. B is quantify the gain if action is taken. And C is find stakeholders who really care about this issue. So C is definitely right. If you can find people who are, um, you know, who are, who are kind of engaged in the issue you're trying to solve, bring them into the process. They will help to align other people behind them, especially if they're high influence. And clearly, as as people, people, I'm glad to see that you guys have chosen C to a large extent. Um, a and B are both correct, but A is better for the simple reason that um, human psychology has a thing in it called loss aversion, which means that people tend to act to avoid a loss more than they will act to achieve a gain. And it's a weird kind of uh, trick of the psyche, really. Um, and if you, I'll talk a bit more later on about a, a field of study called behavioral economics, but this is um, uh, one of the underpinnings of a lot of modern sales thinking, which is that uh, you can and you do need to quantify the potential gain but first, you need to establish the consequences if action is not taken. So if I just move to the next slide, thank you for the poll, Michelle. Sorry, there was a question to repeat that. So um, uh, let, let, perhaps, Jackie, if I can just repeat that using this slide to make the point. Um, there, are two, um, there are two aspects to getting somebody to understand the economics of of engaging in some kind of activity like an L&D initiative. Um, the first is what we colloquially call pain, and the second is gain. So pain is the consequences of not doing something, and gain is the positive consequences of doing it. So if you have um, only pain but no gain, you've got um, you know, a situation where inaction is hurting but I can't see the upside. If you have only gain but no pain, it's like action has value, but it's a nice to have. And really, it's when you have both pain and gain that you know you're you're creating that burning platform for people, and they start to want to act immediately. Um, what I was saying earlier was that pain is of the two the more powerful. It's the one you should aim to establish first because of something called loss aversion. So people will tend to um, act to avoid a loss uh, more than they will act to achieve a gain, which again is, is quite counterintuitive. So building urgency is about helping people to understand the consequences of not acting and then, then the potential ROI if they do. One last point on this is that um, depending on the seniority of the people you're talking to, you might want to try and move the conversation away from a tactical one how do I improve skills towards more of a strategic one? Um, if I were to ask the group, and I'm not going to do that because we don't quite have time, but if I was to ask you as a group, what is strategy? I'm guessing there are 45 people in the group right now. We'd probably get 45 answers that were all different. So I'm going to offer a very brief definition of strategy to say what I mean about moving pain and gain from tactical to strategic. Strategy, in my mind, is about two things. It's about choosing where to compete. Um, and Ranjit, yes, strategy gets eaten by culture. I would, I would agree with Peter Drucker. Um, but equally, culture can be seen as a part of strategy. Um, so strategy, where to compete, is about choosing which products and service categories you want to compete in, uh, to which customers, through which channels, in which geographies. It's like a chessboard. And you're trying to choose which place on the chessboard you want to play based on how attractive those different areas are. It's also about how to compete, which is the assets, the capabilities, the relationships you have as an organization that allow you to create sustainably better value for customers in your chosen area than the other guy. So strategy is about choosing where to compete and about how to compete. Now, 
an L&D initiative can help to create what we call these sustainable competitive advantages, the assets, capabilities, and relationships that allow the organization to compete better for many years into the future, it can also open up new market segments that might be more attractive than the ones we're in currently. So if you're trying to elevate the L&D conversation above the simple tactical level of, you know, I want to get people better at skill X or skill Y, the way to do it is to think, how am I contributing to our sustainable competitive advantage as an organization? And or how am I allowing us to extend or shift our positioning in the marketplace to perhaps a more attractive or a larger potential space. Okay, um, let's move on to assessment of alternatives. And this is where you know, you've know you identified the need, or they have, and now they're looking at a number of different solutions. Maybe the kind of low budget version of what you're proposing, the expensive version, an external supplier, or do nothing as a typical set of options in this kind of scenario. So let's, let's take a look at um, our penultimate question here, which is um, not quite the same structure as the last one, but I want to ask you this question. What percentage of African nations do you think are members of the UN? And I'd like you to consider carefully whether that number is more or less than 10%. So what percentage of African nations are members of the UN, United Nations, and is it more or less than 10%? Well, I'm going to go through and ask a number of questions. And I'd like you to use, if I could ask you to do this, uh, the hand raising icon that's on the top of your Adobe meeting bar. Um, so I'd like you to raise your hand, please, if you think that the number of African nations in the UN is less than 5%. scroll down to see. I think it's three people saying less than 5%. Okay. Um, who thinks it's around four people? Who thinks it's around um, between 5 and 10%? Quite a few. Probably about a third, I would say. Okay. Uh, between 10 and 20%? You've got 22 hands raised there. 22, okay, thank you. So that's half. Um, um, 20, I can't remember what the last one was there. Oh, sorry, 20, 20 to 30%. Yep, same yeah, number, still on 22 30, there. Same number, 30 to 50%. And then 50 to 75 percent. 17. 17. And 75 to 100 percent. And we've gone up one on 18 for that. Okay. So um, what we've seen here is an example of what we call anchoring. And the correct answer to that question, thank you for your help with that, guys, uh, the correct answer is 100%. So all of the African nations are members of the UN. It's actually the biggest block of countries within the UN. Um, but the, um, the the kind of technique here is what, what we typically call behavioral economics. And what happens is that humans get anchored on the first number or the first idea that they're given. And it's very, very hard to shift away from that anchor, even if you know what's going on. Our brains are just wired to stick with that first number. And it's why Trump always comes in with a, an outrageous first offer, because it anchors people at a level that's favorable to him, whether in politics or in business. Um, I'm not saying I support Trump, by the way, but that's one of the techniques he uses. So anchoring is quite useful. Now, in this example, this was an experiment that was done um, where one group of people were asked to consider whether the proportion was more or less than 10%. And the average, as we saw here, was around about 20% that people guessed. Uh, a second control group was asked whether they thought the number of uh, the percentage was greater or less than 60%. And there, 
the answer average was about 65%. So depending on the question you ask, you will get a different answer. And when you're proposing options to the, um, to the organization, bear in mind that the first option you put forward, um, or indeed the first option they've thought about, will tend to anchor their thinking. So if somebody's looked online and found that they can get a trainer in for a thousand pounds a day, and you propose a solution that's 300 grand because you want to do it properly, if they've already anchored themselves at a very low level, it's going to be quite hard for you to shift that anchor. So you need to work on that process um, quite intensively. A second example of um, behavioral economics is um, best, best illustrated, I think, by um, Starbucks. <laughs> so um, as you probably know, there are three main um, sizes of cup in Starbucks. There's tall, grande, and venti. Um, the venti is pretty large. It's almost as big as the human stomach. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to do a show of hands again here, but if I ask people which cup they go for, um, the answer is generally grande. That's generally the one that people pick. Um, and that's because people introduced the venti, um, Starbucks introduced the venti simply to drive sales of the Grande. They had the two cups, but nobody went for the Grande because it's ridiculously big. So they put in the Venti, which made the Grande suddenly look a reasonable choice. Um, I'm sure we've all heard the anecdote of the uh, estate agent taking you to see a number of um, a number of apartments or houses to look at, and you know, there's a couple of horrible ones, and then the one they want you to buy. Uh, this is called the decoy effect. I'm not suggesting that um, uh, that necessarily uh, there are um, lots of situations where one would want to use this without a slight twinge of uh, concern. Um, but if you're positioning options, just be aware that there is a thing called the decoy effect. So, you know, if you want to make a, a moderately expensive solution look attractive, you can put in a very expensive one and suddenly the, the middle one looks pretty good. Incidentally, um, Starbucks realized that the Ventis were pretty profitable and they wanted to sell more of those. So what did they do? They introduced a thing called the Trenta, uh, which is on the right there, which is actually larger than the human stomach, um, <laughs> uh, just to make the, the Venti look better. There is, um, there is actually another thing called a Short, which is on the left there, which is if you don't like a ridiculous amount of coffee, but they won't let you know about that unless you specifically ask for it. Um, there was a question about economic, uh, my, uh, behavioral economics books. Yes, free economics is great. Um, we also have a, a research paper on the application of behavioral economics to sales, um, which I'll be happy to send you if, um, if anybody wants to drop me a note. Uh, my email address will come up at the end, but it's richard at imparter.com. Okay, um, getting into the last section here, managing stakeholders. Um, thank you, Michelle. So, the final poll for you here. So if you're trying to align your stakeholders behind the right decision, uh, what would you do? Would you try to influence or persuade any detractors? Try to decrease the influence of any detractors? Or would you try to strengthen your supporters? So Michelle, if we could put the, the poll in there, thank you. So most people are going for, I like the way this updates real time, it's quite useful actually. Um, so most people are going for try to strengthen your supporters, which is a legitimate uh, strategy here. And I'm going to be honest and say this is a trick question, they're actually all correct. Um, but it's interesting that the, the positive one um, is the one that we all tend towards. Um, uh, in this case, it's the kind of more uh, warm feeling <laughs> strategy perhaps. So if I just move to the next slide, thanks for the poll, Michelle. Um, imagine that you plotted your key stakeholders on a grid um, that shows up the left-hand side influence from low to high, and across the bottom, their alignment with whatever decision you want them to make. They're for on the right-hand side and against on the left-hand side. So Amy um, is a what we call a nemesis. She's a very influential detractor. And in the brackets under her name is her key issue. So her key issue is cost in this case. Bob is a, a moderately um, uh, 
uh, influential supporter, so we call him a champion, and he cares about impact. And Charlie um, is a weak supporter, and Charlie cares about engagement. So if you, if you plot your stakeholders this way, and it's quite a useful tool um, in any decision, we do this pretty much for any pitch we go for, um, and uh, you'll start to see that there are strategies you can evolve. So for Amy, or a nemesis, you can either improve their alignment by persuading or influencing them, <clears throat> or you can try and reduce their level of influence, perhaps by um, bringing in other people or strengthening your supporters, because influence is a relative thing. For Bob, you might want to strengthen his um, level of influence by giving him data, coaching, um, materials to present with, all of the things that you can do to, to help Bob do better, and even more so for Charlie. Linking back to the earlier question we asked, um, there's also the option of finding other people who are more champions, uh, Dawn here, and bringing them in, and they can even be third parties, so there might be you know, an external uh, supplier who has the, the ear of the board um, and can put a, a case that kind of moves the the balance of the group in the right direction during the thinking process. So that's stakeholder alignment. I'm going to touch very briefly on risk. I'm not, we're getting a little short on time, and I want to leave some time for questions. So I'm not going to do the poll here, but um, I'll just show it to you. So I'm worried that I won't see a return on this, and the activity training doesn't work, right? Um, and so one of the options here is, can I ask you the reason you think that? And that is the best answer here. It's like, if there's a risk, the best thing you can do is try to understand what that risk is about. I mentioned four levels of value earlier, <coughs> strategic, tactical, political, and individual. <coughs> Excuse me. And because risk is about the risk of value not being delivered or potentially being destroyed, <coughs> those four levels are equally relevant when we're talking about risk. So uncover what the risks that the stakeholders perceive are. Um, and this is where a lot of a lot of things get derailed. So you might get to the point where you've proposed an idea, they've gone, yes, that's great, and then it just stalls or the budget never gets allocated. And often that is because of risk. So there are three things you can do in the case of risk. One is to correct misperception. Um, if there is a perception of risk that you don't believe is, is correct, then you can bring evidence to the floor to demonstrate that. So training doesn't work, well, actually it does if you do it right, and here's some evidence. Uh, the second is you can reduce the likelihood of the risk happening, um, which is what we call prevention. So, for example, having a proper implementation plan, doing a full TNA, that kind of thing can reduce the likelihood of things going wrong. And finally, you can reduce the impact if something does go wrong. So, in effect, that's an insurance policy, um, which might be having you know a service level agreement with a, a third party supplier or um, you know, having some kind of early warning system to make sure that you know um, and can and adjust quickly if things are going off track. So uncovering and alleviating risk um, is actually a pretty critical part of the buying process. The last thing I wanted to touch on very, very briefly um, was trust. And you may have heard of a chap called David Meister. He wrote a book called The Trusted Advisor. Um, which I would commend to you as a um, as a reading. Uh, trust is a difficult thing to pin down in, in a business context, but I think David did a really good job with something that he called the trust equation. So trust in his eyes is credibility plus reliability plus intimacy, all divided by self-orientation. Credibility is, uh, do you know your stuff? to put it really simply. Are you an expert in your field? Reliability is, do you do what you say you will do? Do you respond with the proposal when you say you will? Uh, do you get back to people when you say you will? And so on. Intimacy is about business intimacy. It's about, do I care about the business problems that need to be sold, solved? And am I willing to invest the time and the energy and the emotional engagement to really feel like I'm on your side as a business person. All of those, you can imagine a, sc a score from 1 to 10, but they all get divided by this thing called self-orientation. Forgive me if you have uh, come across this before. Self-orientation is, am I pursuing my own agenda above 
yours as a customer, even an internal customer. And it can come through at a macro level, which is, you know, we've got people in the L&D team who, um, who need stuff to do, so I need to do this project. Uh, that's macro self-orientation. Or it can come through at a micro level when, for example, um, people talk over um, the customer in a conversation or want to look good or want to look intelligent or smart in that kind of dialogue. So you can be as credible and as reliable and as intimate with the business as you like, but if you display the traits of self-orientation, you can destroy that trust really, really quickly. So my last thought on this is, um, you know, as you engage with the business, try to keep an eye on your own self-orientation. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have an agenda, um, but it does mean that you should suspend that agenda while you're engaging um, with the with the internal client or the external client, and um, and good, I'm I'm seeing that you guys are enjoying the behavioural economics stuff. It's kind of cool and interesting stuff. So I'm I'm glad that you are enjoying it. So um, again, if we had time, I was going to ask you to assess that trust equation for yourself for an important stakeholder. I won't do that now, but perhaps offline you might want to do that and just have a think about the strategies you could apply um, to improve yourself in each of those areas. So in summary then, <coughs> you know, L&D is, is often trying to sell things. We're trying to sell ideas, we're trying to sell initiatives, and um, that means we're trying to influence and guide people around this decision process. And there are different skills that we need to use at each stage of that process. Um, so uh, it's it's kind of not a question of bringing a skill because you've got it. It's knowing which skill to use at which point. So understanding where your um, different projects are in that buying cycle can be really valuable. I'd almost suggest you know printing that buying cycle out, stick it on the wall, and put post-it notes on for each of your projects to know where they are and move them around as you go. So. Um, when I talk to salespeople, I say that you know there's a lot of stuff there, uh, a lot of tools, a lot of concepts. As in sport, selling or, or getting L&D projects across the line is kind of an aggregation of marginal gains. You only have to do you know, lots of things just a little bit better to have a big impact. It's like the British racing team where, um, the, the, I won't mention the country, but one of the other country teams said, the British have specially round wheels, and that's why we were winning all the races. But actually, as David Brailsford, the, the coach, said, um, you know, it's about the aggregation of marginal gains. Do everything you do 1% better, and you'll have a massively different result. So thank you very much for your attention. Sorry that I've been a bit um, coldy and a bit croaky, but uh, I hope that that hasn't impacted. I would be really happy to take any final questions um, in the last five or ten minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. I hope I do. I feel like I've had a cold since Christmas, so I'm looking forward to not having one. If you do have any questions there for Richard, do share any questions that you have. Richard, I think you're being bombarded with, with positive comments there. Many people are saying how useful it was to them. And I must admit, I, I do agree. I particularly liked what you were talking about in terms of, of anchoring and the behavioral economics and the stakeholder alignment too. And I think that uh, behavioral economics got, got many of us thinking here today. So really, really interesting. Uh, Jackie says that book orders are going to be high this afternoon. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think you, you, need, you need a cut there, I think, Richard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'll send out yeah I think, I think you need to. Uh, <laughs> somebody mentioned The Nudge, and that, that is another book that's relevant in this space. Um, it was uh, David Cameron's favorite book, which might be a, a good or a bad thing, depending on your view. But uh, The Nudge was one of the things that influenced the government quite a bit in the last sort of five years or so. Um, but, uh, you know, again, if anybody wants to drop me a note, uh, it's just richard at imparta.com. Um, I would be really happy to send a PDF of our research, which is actually relevant in both B2B and B2C, so consumer sales, because um, this stuff can be quite effective in contact centers and... Uh, 
Okay, you've got a question coming in there from Matthew. I don't know if you saw that. He said, Richard, can you talk more about how to influence a nemesis when plotting your stakeholders? Yeah, um, great question, Matthew. So I, I don't know if you guys have come across, I'm sure you have, um, many of you come across the different influencing styles. Um, so one of the first things I'd say if you have a nemesis is is to understand why they feel the way they do. So often people have a particular focus um, that might be cost or it might be they've had a bad experience with um, this kind of initiative in the past. So you know, in any situation where I'm trying to move somebody's opinion, generally I start with understanding why they have that opinion in the first place because then I know what I'm dealing with. So I would ask questions. If, you, if they won't talk to you, I'd ask questions of people that know them. Uh, and then depending on their inf their most likely influencing style to work, I would use a different approach. So some people are very logical, um, some people are very emotional, some people will respond to authority and so on. Um, and if you, if you just Google influencing styles, you come across a wealth of material on that. So uh, the, the brief answer is understand why they are where they are and, um, you know, is it a First of all, is it a misperception, in which case you can correct it? But secondly, what are their you know, most preferred styles of being influenced? And then use that to try and shift them. Leverage other people. So you can leverage your champions to try and move the nemesis across. Or, as I indicated, bring in other people and strengthen your champions so that the nemesis gets pushed down in influence by virtue of the facts and the data that your champions have at their fingertips. Uh, the question about the trust book, the trust book is called The Trusted Advisor, um, and the author is Dave, uh, one of the authors, the main one was David Maester, N-A-I-S-T-E-R. That's the one. Thank you, Jackie. Um, so there's a question there about uh, strategy being eaten by culture uh, from Jackie. How, how do you avoid that issue or to help with that issue? Um, <laughs> So I guess, uh, you know, culture is something that tends to be relatively top down. Um, uh, you know, if I look at my own organization, it's quite scary because I see myself reflected in it, both the good bits and the bad bits. And uh, I think if, if culture is eating strategy, um, you know, culture is something that can be shifted. And um, as I said earlier, when I think about strategy, culture is one of the key elements of how to compete. You know, you need the right culture in order to be able to deliver the strategy. So I think if that's the case, the, the best advice I would do is try and raise that cultural issue as a concrete and genuine issue at a high level in the organization. Say, we need to have a culture change program. So um, uh, we have a, a, a an area of our business that focuses on trying to sell anything, but we have an area that focuses on culture change. It's a real thing, and um, it's something that a lot of organizations do in order to avoid culture-eating strategy.